class that tackles topics of concerns for yes. our mommy and moms to be. It's a series of lecture that will help guide you through your journey. For today, we have three speakers who will share with you their insights on the topics assigned to them. Please feel free to ask them questions or share your experiences and comments. Again, thank you for attending today and we look forward to seeing you in the future Alagang Ina Lectures. Thank you, Dr. Abad. Of course, the journey to motherhood is really an exciting one. But all pregnant women have many fears and doubts. The Alagang Ina project of the VRP Medical Center Department of OBGYN aims to guide mothers and mothers-to-be in this journey. We prepare lectures that are not relevant, that are relevant and helpful, and hope that this may somehow help in your journey throughout pregnancy and motherhood. So we have prepared three lectures for today from members of our staff of the uh, VRP Medical Center. Uh, we have, let me introduce to you our speakers for this morning, who will talk on uh, topics that are very relevant to pregnancy and uh, first through prenatal checkup and pregnancy. Our first speaker is Dr. Henrica Bianca Kristen Caliano Garcia, who is a member of the consultant staff of the OBGYN in VRP. Her topic is on prenatal care and immunizations. The second lecture is going to be given by another member of our staff in the VRP Medical Center, Dr. Jerali S. Carlos. She will speak about maternal nutrition and exercises. Our third lecture is going to be given by Dr. Ana Selina Valenzuela, who is also one of the active consultants of the OBGYN department, who will talk about ultrasound in obstetrics. So um, let us start. I call in Dr. Garcia to start with our lecture. Thank you. And if you have any questions, you can type them on the chat box and we will answer all questions uh, after all the lectures. Uh, as an add-on, we have raffles in between and after the program. Thank you, have a good day. Dr. Garcia. Hello, good morning everyone. Ready na ba kayong for this morning's learnings and uh, activities? I hope everyone is ready. So for this morning, I am given the topic of prenatal care. Uh, for the next slide po, Next slide. This will be the outline of my discussion. So we will first tackle the diagnosis of pregnancy and then move on to the initial prenatal evaluation and then uh, subsequent prenatal visits and then through the nutritional counseling and of course, common concerns. Next slide. So prenatal care is uh, done to promote and educate the mothers or mothers-to-be uh, for, the, for their journey in pregnancy. This is also done for medical and psychosocial intervention, and this is a standard. This is a way to have standard standardized documentation uh, during your pregnancy. So the major goals is to define the health status of the mother and the fetus, to estimate the gestational age, and to initiate a plan for continuing obstetrical care. Next slide. So for pregnancy. Uh, this is usually diagnosed with signs and symptoms. So the most common are these three that are listed in the slide, which are amenorrhea, uterine bleeding, and maternal perception of movement. Amenorrhea usually constitutes uh, missed menses. And of course, uterine bleeding, but you may wonder, uterine bleeding in missed menses nga. So not all pregnancies will have continuous amenorrhea. Uterine bleeding is usually seen when there's implantation bleeding. And of course, later on in the pregnancy, maternal perception of movement will be noted. Next slide. So for this slide, uh, it is nice to note that HCG is the one that is um, detected by your at-home pregnancy test. It is a hormone produced by the syncytial trophoblast. Uh, this, is usually, this usually can be detected by the home pregnancy test with 
about two weeks of Miss Menses, some more uh, uh, more sensitive, but it is also important to note that at home pregnancy tests, uh, some are not that uh, sensitive or may result with a negative result. So we usually rely on the laboratory methods to have a more uh, more accurate diagnosis of pregnancy by using HCG. Next slide. So for the measurement of the HCG, uh, this light only shows the level of HCG seen in the blood. So if you will note at the 10th to 12th week of pregnancy, this is where usually HCG peaks. So this is where you will note uh, mga morning sickness because HCG will usually cause nausea and vomiting. Next slide. Uh, other causes of positive pregnancy tests. So you may wonder, some people or there are circumstances where there's a pregnancy, a positive pregnancy test, but the person is not pregnant. So uh, positive assays may be caused by uh, exo exogenous HCG injection for weight loss or oral intake of HCG for weight loss, renal failure with impaired HCG clearance, physiologic pituitary HCG, and HCG producing tumors. So like what I mentioned, home pregnancy tests may be used to diagnose pregnancy, but uh, it is usually more accurate to do a laboratory test. With the sonographic recognition, this will be discussed by Dr. Ina Valenzuela later on, but uh, to give you an overview, uh, usually we see signs of pregnancy at about four to five weeks age of gestation. So at four to five weeks, a gestational sac will be seen. At the middle of the fifth week, the yolk sac will be seen. And by sixth week, the embryo with cardiac motion will be present. Next slide. This is what you will see during the first trimester ultrasound or the early ultrasound, the intradecidual sign and the double decidual sign. Next slide. For the initial prenatal evaluation, um, we will first tackle is def the definitions of pregnancy or uh, definitions related to pregnancy, the normal pregnancy duration, the previous and current health status of the patient, and clinical evaluation, uh, laboratory tests, and pregnancy risk assessment. Next slide. Uh, for the definitions, nolligravid is usually, uh, nolligravid is defined by a person or a woman who is currently not pregnant or has never been pregnant. A gravid patient is currently pregnant or has been pregnant in the past. It may be pre-gravid if this is the first pregnancy or has been pregnant with uh, once in the past or multigravid if the patient is uh, on her second or more pregnancy or uh, was currently preg was pregnant with two or more in the past. For a nulipara, uh, it, has, it is defined as a, a woman who has never completed a pregnancy beyond 20 weeks gestation and a primipara who delivered only once. Multipara completed two or more pregnancy to 20 weeks gestation. Next slide. So the normal duration of pregnancy is about 280 days or 40 weeks. And the first trimester ultrasound is the most accurate method to establish or reaffirm the gestational age. So for the first trimester, it usually encompasses the first to the 14th week, and the second trimester, the 14th to the 28th week, and the third trimester from the 29th week to the 40, 42nd week. So by Nigeli rule, we can determine the expected date of delivery. So this is usually done by adding the seven days to the first day of the last menstrual period and subtracting three months. So for example, if you if your last normal menstrual period was June 5, 2020, by subtra subtracting three months, we get March, and then adding seven days to the date, uh, five plus seven is 12, so your estimated date of delivery is March 12, 2021. This is usually done by obstetrician, but um, uh, this could easily be estimated at home by using this rule. Next slide. So for the psychosocial screening, psychosocial issues are the non-biomedical factors uh, with or without pregnancy. So this is done at least once per trimester. And uh, this, this, these are usually 
uh, barriers to care if these are present and are communication obstacles and then they affect nutritional status or um, if the patient comes from an unstable housing and then for the desire for pregnancy and the safety concerns. Next slide. So cigarette smoking, we all know that it has teratogenic effects. So this can cause miscarriage, preterm delivery, stillbirth, low birth weight, placental abruption, placenta pivia, and premature rupture of membranes. So during pregnancy, we usually advise smoking cessation, and we usually assess the patient's uh, cigarette habits by using the five A's. We ask, we advise, we assess, we assist, and then we arrange. Uh, behavioral interventions are usually what we advise to encourage smoking cessation. And for those who are having difficulties with cessation, we usually uh, recommend nicotine replacement products, such as patches and gums. Next slide. So alcohol is another teratogen for pregnancy. If a woman consumes uh, great amounts of alcohol during pregnancy, we usually see a fetal alcohol syndrome. So this is seen in the picture in the slide. So fetal alcohol syndrome is usually a normal, uh, not normal, uh, a usual, this usual fascist is seen with uh, consumption of alcohol. So we see the low nasal bridge, the epicanthal folds, the short palpebral fissures, the flat mid face and short nostrils, the thin upper lip, the minor ear abnormalities, the indistinct philtrum and microglyphia. Next slide. Illicit drugs also, also are not recommended during pregnancy. This may cause intrauterine growth restriction, low birth weight, and withdrawal. So for, method, for heroin, we give methadone, 30 milligrams daily as maintenance to aid in cessation. And we also give buprenorphine or naloxone. For intimate partner violence, um, this is usually more common, but not really detected because uh, usually this is hidden from the primary care physician. So this is a pattern of assault and coercive behavior. It may cause intrauterine growth restriction, preterm delivery, and prenatal death. So domestic violence screening at least once per trimester is done. Next slide. For the clinical evaluation, assessment of gestational age is usually done with first trimester sonography and also with uterine sites. So if you will see here, we, uh, when you are brought to the delivery room for examination or when you, are, uh, when you go to your obstetrician for a prenatal consult, they usually do a fundic height assessment. So this will usually assess the size of the uterus if it is compatible with your gestational age. Next slide. So this is the typical components of the routine prenatal care. Medyo busy po yung slide, but... Uh, for the first visit, usually we do the complete physical examination and the important laboratory tests. So usually a CBC, a blood type, the pap smear, glucose tolerance, uh, urinalysis or uh, urine culture, and then serology for infectious diseases like rubella, syphilis, gonococcal and hepatitis, and HIV screen. Next slide. For the cervical infections, uh, ACOG or the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommend that all women be screened for chlamydia during the first prenatal visit and at the third trimester for those at increased risk. So if you're not increased risk, this may be omitted at the first trimester screening. And this uses the nucleic acid amplification testing. If positive, we do the test of cure. And the treatment for chlamydia is azithromycin, one gram as a single dose. So gonorrhea is also screened. This also uses the NAAT or culture, and the treatment is eftriaxone by 250 milligram intramuscular in injection and azithromycin, one gram for it. Next slide. So this is a slide which shows, shows which conditions for which maternal and fetal medicine cons consultation may be beneficial. So uh, we usually do a comprehensive past medical history and previous illnesses, and then we assess based on this method. Next. For the subsequent prenatal visits, next slide. 
So we usually ask you to come back every four weeks until the 28th week. And usually every two weeks until the 36th week and weekly thereafter. So the WHO or World Health Organization recommends a median of five prenatal visits. But if you are at high risk or with a high risk pregnancy, we ask you to come back uh, on a more frequent basis. Next slide. So the prenatal surveillance, like what I mentioned earlier, the fundic height is between measured between 20 to 34th week of pregnancy, and then it correlates somewhat accurately to the, to the gestational age. This is to monitor fetal growth and amniotic fluid volume, and this is measured from the top of the synthesis pubis to the top of the fundus. Next slide. Fetal heart sounds is almost always detectable by 10 weeks by fetal doctor. Yun po yung ginagamit sa clinic, uh, the one that is used by your obstetrician. And then the normal fetal heartbeat ranges from 110 to 160 beats per minute. This is if a fetal doctor is not available, a stethoscope may be used at 20 weeks. And there are two kinds of sound that we heard, the phoenix of play and the uterine of play. So the phoenix of play is the sharp whistling sound synchronous with the fetal pulse. And the uterine of play is the soft blowing pulse synchronous with the maternal pulse. Next slide. So sonography is uh, useful information that tells us or gives us information regarding fetal anatomy, growth, and the delivery timing. So uh, usually, of course, all, all cephalic pregnancies will undergo a trial of normal labor and delivery, but usually uh, a breach presentation in ultrasound may warrant or a scheduled cesarean section already. So repeated sonography should be performed only when there is a val valid medical indication. We usually do this once per trimester, so you should have at least three ultrasounds during the duration of your pregnancy. Next slide. For subsequent laboratory infection, we usually screen for group B streptococcal infection. Uh, ngayon po, because this is not done previously or mga olden years. So we usually get a rectal and vaginal swab at 35 to 37 weeks gestation, and a positive uh, result will warrant an intrapartum antimicrobial prophylaxis. So this is uh, by giving by giving antibiotic intravenously while you are in labor. Women with group B strep bacteriuria or a previous infant with invasive disease are given empirical intrapartum prophylaxis. Next slide. Okay. What is recommended is a penicillin G intravenous injection every four hours until delivery. Or if you have a uh, penicillin allergy, cefazolin, two grams IV loading dose, clindamycin 900 milligrams IV every eight hours, and vancomycin one gram intravenous every 12 hours. Next slide. Gestational diabetes mellitus is um, a problem for Filipino women because uh, being Filipino, it is attached to our race that we are predisposed to diabetes. So all pregnant women should be screened for GDM. We usually look at the history. If you have a history of diabetes or was diagnosed with diabetes prior to the pregnancy, and we also ask your family history. So there is a strong positivity of um, likelihood of diabetes mellitus if you have a family history such as with your parents or your siblings and we also look at the clinical factors or routine laboratory testing. Next slide. For the neural tube defect in genetic screening, this is optional. Uh, this is usually done at 15 to 20, 20th week age of the gestation and uh, it is usually done by a serum screening. Uh, at 11 to 14th week, we can do fetal aneuploidy screening by uh, also serum. And this is somewhat costly. So we only recommend this for patients who are at high risk for, the, for having fetuses with neural tube and genetic problems. Next slide. For nutritional counseling, we advise you with weight gain recommendations. If there is severe undernutrition, 
weight retention after pregnancy, dietary recommend, recommended allowances, calories with calories, proteins, minerals, and vitamins. Next slide. For the weight gain recommendation, we usually follow this table. If you're underweight, you are recommended to have a total weight gain of 28 to 40 pounds for the whole duration of your pregnancy. If you have normal weight, um, we usually allow 25 to 35 pounds. For overweight patients, we usually allow 15 to 25 pounds. And for obese, we allow 11 to 20 pounds weight gain during the duration of pregnancy. Next slide. For the dietary recommendations, we usually give folic acid recommendations at the first trimester until you reach the 16th week. Uh, usually, this is given at 600 micrograms for pregnant patients and lactating for lactating patients, we usually give 500 micrograms. We usually give iron, zinc, iron, iron, zinc and um, vitamin C supplementation. Next slide. For the, for the calorie intake, pregnancy usually requires 80,000 kilocalories during the last 20 weeks. Um, the demands is 300 kilocalories per day increased during pregnancy. And for the first trimester, usually we recommend none. For the sec no extra calories, sorry, recommended for the first trimester. For the second trimester, additional 340 kilocalories. And for the third trimester, 452 kilocalories per day. Next slide. Protein is a requirement because it demands for growth and remodeling of the fetus, placenta, uterus, and the breast, and for increased maternal blood volume. So for the second half of pregnancy, we usually require 1,000 grams of protein amounting to 5 to 6 grams per day. Next slide. For iron, uh, 300 milligrams of iron is usually transferred to fetus and the placenta. 500 milligrams is incorporated into, into the expanding maternal hemoglobin mass. And what is recommended is 27 milligrams of elemental iron per day. So we give 60 to 100 milligrams elemental iron per day for multiple, multiple fetal gestation. So we usually give um, iron supplementation at the 16th week of pregnancy because iron usually causes upset stomach. So coupled with the um, doubling HCG, uh, this may upset or aggravate nausea and vomiting. So that's why we give it during the second trimester. Next slide. For iodine, what is recommended is 220 micrograms per day. This is this can be this can be taken from iodized salt and bread in the diet. And deficiency usually results to cretinism, which is a multiple severe neurologic deficit. Next slide. For the calcium, what is recommended is 1,000 milligrams per day. This is retained by the pregnant. What is retained by the pregnant woman during gestation is 30 grams. So most most of this is deposited in the fetus late in the pregnancy for bone growth. So I we usually give calcium during the first trimester also because this is known to prevent preeclampsia. Next. For zinc, the recommended daily allowance is 12 milligrams. Deficiency leads to poor wound healing, poor appetite, and suboptimal growth. For selenium, the recommended daily allowance is 60 micrograms to 70 micrograms per day. And deficiency leads to fetal, cardio fetal cardiomyopathy. Potassium usually declines by 0.5 milliequivalents by mid-pregnancy. Mid and what is recommended is 4.7 grams. Deficiency... Um, results in hyperemesis gravitar. For vitamins, folic acid was, was, was what I mentioned earlier. What is recommended is 400 micrograms to 600 micrograms. And this is usually used to prevent neural tube defects. So we usually give a woman with a prior NTD child with 4 milligrams daily. Vitamin A, um, if more than 10,000 in international units is consumed, this may lead to congenital malformation and deficiency leads to night blindness, increased risk of maternal anemia and spontaneous preterm birth. Next slide. Vitamin B12, uh, the level drops in pregnancy due to reduced plasma level of carrier proteins, the transcobalamins, and vitamin B6 and doxylamine, daily 2 milligrams of vitamin B6 is useful to help in nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. 
for vitamin C, recommended daily allowance is 80 to 85 milligrams per deciliter. Any more, it will only be excreted in the urine. Vitamin D boosts the efficiency of intestinal calcium, or calcium absorption and promotes bone mineralization and growth. Next slide. For the common concerns, uh, this is what we usually what were what are usually asked during prenatal visits. So let's go to them one by one. Next slide. For employment, it is not usually employment is not contraindication to pregnancy. For pregnancy is not contraindication to employment. So what is usually Caution is occupational fatigue, and we usually advise the patients to avoid any occupation that subjects to severe physical strain because they, they, this may lead to preterm birth. And we usually require adequate periods of rest or rest in between, um, rest during your work in between um, weekly work strenuous activities. For exercise, at least 150 minutes per week of mild to moderate exercise is recommended. So this will be tackled by Dr. Jerry Carlos, our next speaker. Next slide. Huh? Seafood consumption is not contraindicated because fish are excellent. Fish is usually an excellent source of protein, are low in saturated fat, and contains omega-3 fatty acids. But we ask you to avoid consuming shark, swordfish, king, mac king mackerel, and tilefish because they are high in mercury content. For lead, more than 45 micrograms per deciliter will lead to lead poisoning and will lead to gestational hypertension, miscarriage, low birth weight, and neurodevelopmental impairments if exposed to pregnant women. Next slide. So um, when riding the automobile, we, we usually advise a three-point restraint. So the middle picture, the one with a check mark, is the proper way to um, wear your seatbelt. So you usually rest the seatbelt across your chest and um, put the seatbelt below or under your belly when securing your seatbelt. And for air travel, you can safely fly up to three to six weeks. This is usually um, done safely and your obstetrician may give you, usually um, airlines require medical certificate for you to fly and you can request this with your obstetrician. Next slide. Coitus is not harmful, but avoided in cases of miscarriage, placenta previa, and preterm labor. And of course, this usually will depend on the preference of the pregnant woman. Dental care. Um, pregnancy is not a contraindication to dental treatment, including the dental radiographs, because some form of um, dental caries or infection may also cause preterm labor. Next slide. Vaccination. We also recommend vaccination for immunization during pregnancy. So what are contraindicated are the live attenuated vir virus vaccines, which are the following, measles, mumps, rubella, polio, yellow fever, varicella, and smallpox. Next slide. Next slide po. Other, other vaccines such as influenza is recommended. Rabies may be given um, if indicated. Human papillomavirus or the cervical cancer vaccine is not recommended. And the hepatitis B for pre-exposure and post-exposure only. Hepatitis A, the same for pre-exposure and post-exposure only. Next slide. So in the inactivated vi viral vac vaccines, um, it's usually recommended for um, non-pregnant only as well as the meningococcus, typhoid, and anthrax. Tetanus toxoid is recommended in every pregnancy, prefer preferably between 27 and 36 weeks to maximize the passive of um, acquired immunity to the fetus. Next slide. Specific immune globulin such as hepatitis, rabies, and tetanus is usually use used for post-exposure -ex prophylaxis. Next slide. 
um, coffee is allowed in a limited amount, usually less than 300 milligrams per day or three to five ounce cups per day. Uh, any more than that may cause um, preterm labor or uh, teratogenic effects if consumed during the first trimester. For nausea and vomiting, we usually recommend you to have small frequent feedings and to supplement with vitamin B6 and doxylamine to um, alleviate mild symptoms. So heartburn is, the upward displacement, uh, is caused by the upward displacement and compression of the stomach by the uterus and um, combined with the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter brought about by effects of your hormones or pregnancy hormones. Next slide. Pica is usually craving of pregnant women for strange food or inedible, inedible objects such as hair, uh, soil, and the TLSM is usually profuse salivation. Next slide. For headache, we usually recommend acetaminophen or paracetamol. Uh, for the back pain, this is usually due to um, increasing gestation. This is more prevalent in obese women and we can recommend orthopedic examination and we may give cyclobenzaprine or baclofen and a support belt or a uh, belt that supports your belly to ease back pain. For varicosities and hemorrhoids, femoral venous pressures in the supine gravida rises about 8 millimogram, millimeters mercury in early pregnancy to 24 millimeters mercury at term. So treatment is periodic rest with leg elevation, elastic stockings, or both. And for vulvar varicosities, this may be alleviated by fitted pantyhose stockings, foam rubber pads suspended across the vulva, and the hemorrhoids usually is treated with anesthetics, warm soaks, and stool softening agents, incision and removal of the clot following injection of a local anesthetic. But these usually will um, resolve on their own during the after the termination of pregnancy. Next slide. For sleeping and fatigue, um, this is a soporific effect of progesterone. So if you will notice during the first trimester, medyo mas antukin tayo, and sleep efficiency diminishes as pregnancy advances. This is usually due to the discomfort caused by the enlarging gravity uterus. And this is managed by having daytime naps and mild sedatives at bedtime, such as diphenhydrin. So I think this is my last slide. Yes, this is my last slide. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat box. Thank you and good day. Does anyone have any questions, Paul? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Garcia. So uh, questions, please type them in the chat box and we will deal with questions during the open forum. So now we open the floor to our next speaker, Dr. J. Lee Carlos, who will talk about um, maternal nutrition and exercises. Thank you. Good morning and thank you, Dr. Agawili, for your pleasant introduction. Um, today, let me share with you a topic which is part of our daily living and is more important for our mothers to be, which is maternal nutrition and exercise. Uh, for our disclaimer, I am not a nutritionist or nor a dietitian to discuss the nitty-gritty of calculating specific um, kilocalories of each day, but I do hope I would be able to impart with you its importance, especially the possible side effects of to your baby. Next slide, please. So first we start with maternal exercise. First, um, exercise is an extremely important part of staying healthy uh, in general, and it is also in the case when you are pregnant. When done correctly, exercise can improve your immune system, blood circulation, enhance muscle recovery to ensure that your aches and pains are reduced during your during the duration of your pregnancy. Next slide, please. So you may ask, is it safe to exercise during pregnancy? So if you are healthy and your pregnancy is in a normal state, meaning walang problem, walang mga um, sakit sa puso, sakit sa baga, uh, may high blood diabetes, 
or um in general it is in a healthy state and condition um it is safe to continue or start a regular physical activity but um you have to note also that physical activity does not increase the risk of miscarriages low birth weight or early delivery uh, however if this um exercise regimes are um better to discuss with your OBGYN um especially during the early prenatal visits ne next slide please so women with the following conditions or pregnancy complications should not exercise during pregnancy such as um patients with certain heart and lung diseases um patients with circular or what we call a cervical stitch for those who have a short service because uh because they have uh they are at risk for preterm birth and being pregnant with uh, with twins or more, like such as triplets, because these are risk factors for preterm labor. Placenta previa, or what we call yung nauuna uh, ang inunan after the 26th weeks of pregnancy, because they are at risk for um, vaginal bleeding as well. Then preterm labor or ruptured bag of membranes. Or so preeclampsia or pregnancy induced high, high blood pressure as well. Kaya dahil ang pag ejercicio ay nakakataas din po ito ng um ng pressure po. Then severe anemia also because you'll be needing uh, more oxygenation during exercises. Next slide, please. So, what are the benefits of exercise during pregnancy? O ang mga beneficyo na pag e habang nagbubuntis? Um, regular exercise would benefit you and your fetus in, um, in reducing back pain, promoting healthy weight gain during pregnancy. It eases constipation and improves your general fitness and strength your heart, to your heart and blood vessels. It may decrease the risk of diabetes, uh, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and cesarean delivery, and it could even help you lose um, the baby weight after your baby is born. So, in short, nakakabilis ng pagpapahayat at pagpabawas ng timbang ang nakaakumula habang nagbubuntis. Next slide, please. So, pwede mo itanong na, Doc, how much exercise should I do during pregnancy? So, at least you do a, ideally, a pregnant woman should go, get at least 150 minutes of moderately intense aerobic ex, uh, aerobic activity every week. So what do you mean by um, aerobic activity? It means you move your large, the large muscles of your body, moderate intensity, meaning it, you move enough to raise your heart rate and start sweating. Examples of this are brisk walking or, well, general gardening because especially um, during the pandemic, um, nearly or all of our, um, a lot of our mommies and mommies to be have become plenty as then as well. So even though uh, gardening could also help you with this, and you could begin with this, it could begin with as little as five minutes per day. So, uh, pwede itong hati in into ten minutes of exercise per day in in a span of five days or even smaller like. Um, 10 minutes in the whole day. So if you're new to exercises, you could um, start out slowly and gradually to increase your, uh, you could uh, start it slowly and gradually while you increase your activity. So you could, well, like I said earlier, you can begin as, as little as five minutes per day. Then you add five minutes each week until you can stay active for at least 30 minutes a day. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So what changes does occur in the body during pregnancy that can affect the exercise routine? So number one, your joints could cause um, the ligaments to become more relaxed, which makes your joints more mobile. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so we avoid key bouncy or high impact motions, which can risk your, um, which can increase the risk of you being hurt. For your balance, the extra weight in the front of your body shifts towards your center of gravity. 
So um, this place more stress, uh, more stress on your joints and muscles, especially those in the pelvis and the lower back, because you are uh, much more less stable and more likely to lose your balance. Hence, at greater risk of falling. And breathing, when you exercise, um, the oxygen and blood flow are di directed to your muscles and away from the other areas of your body. Hence, while on your when on your pregnant state your need of oxygen increases and may affect the ability to do strenuous exercises, especially if you're over, overweight or in the obese category. Next slide, please. So what precautions should I take when I, when I do exercises during pregnancy? Um, first, you could drink plenty of water before, during, and after your workout because there are si the signs of dehydrations are dizziness, a racing or pounding heart, yung parang kinakabogan dib dib, then um, urinating only small amounts of uh, urine or even a dark yellow urine. <clears throat> Wearing a sports bra that gives a lot of support to help, pro to help protect your breast because, and later in pregnancy, a belly support belt may reduce the, the discomfort while walking or running um, and also avoid become overheated. So, uh, when we say about avoid being overheated, you should wear loose fitting clothes and exercise. If you do exercises, you must do it in a temperature control room, especially nowadays that um it's already um summer, so must ma in it. Um, we do recommend that you should be in a well controlled uh well controlled temperature room. Then do not exercise when it's very hot or humid and avoid standing still or lay, laying flat on your back as much as possible because when you lie on your back your uterus would press on a large vein, vein that returns blood to the heart and standing motionless for uh, standing motionless or standing for long for long periods of time can cause the blood to pool on your legs and feet in this position uh, may cause your blood pressure to decrease as well for a short time Next slide, please. So what are some, what are safe exercises that I can do during pregnancy? So we could do walking such as brisk walk because it, it gives a total body workout <clears throat> and easy on the joints and muscles. Swimming and water workouts. Water workouts can be used to um, alleviate also um, um, pains of body muscles. Um, it also supports your weight so you do not, uh, it also supports your weight because um, it helps you avoid injury and muscle strains. Stationary bicycle because of your growing belly, um, it could your balance can be affected and you could be more prone to falls. Hence, riding a standard bicycle during pregnancy um, can be risky for you and for your baby. So, if you're going to opt to do cycling, um, a stationary bike would be a much better choice. Then modified yoga and modified Pilates. So yoga could reduce stress, improve, improve flexibility, and encourage stretching and focus breathing. Um, there are many prenatal yogas and Pilates classes designed for pregnant women in all in all um trimesters. Um, and they teach modified poses that can accommodate a pregnant woman shifting balance. And you should avoid uh, certain poses that would require you to be still or lying on your back for long periods. But as I said, you should always also uh, consult your OBGYN before engaging or trying to start these kinds of activities. Next slide, please. So what exercises should I avoid during pregnancy? Because it could risk, uh, it could put you and your baby at risk of injury. So Contact sports such as getting hit by getting hit in the abdomen, like boxing, soccer, basketball, any activities that may result into falls, such as surfing, off cycle, off road cycling, gymnastics, and horseback riding, um, hot yoga and hot pilates because this could cause you to become overheated, and scuba diving um, may affect the amount of oxygen in your body. So next, please. So what are the warning signs that I should know 
so I, I should know in order for me to stop exercising. So if there's any bleeding from the vagina, dizziness, shortness of breath, chest pain, headache, muscle weakness, calf pain or swelling, regular or painful and regular and painful contractions, or if there's any fluid gushing or leaking from the vagina. Next, please. So why is it? Uh, you may ask, Doctor, bakit kailangan ko pa mag-exercise after mag after manganak? Inanganak na po ako ganyan. So number one, it could um help improve your mood and decrease the risk of vein thrombosis or what we call um uh it is a, it is a condition um more frequent in women um the weeks after childbirth. Uh, ito yung tiyatawag na pagkakaroon ng pamumuo ng dugo sa may ugat po and um number uh, also like i said earlier exercising after the baby's born can help you lose the extra pounds that you may ha you may have gained during your pregnancy next please so um here is um some video of some exercises that you can do safely at home it differs um per trimester because of their increase in belly size uh, so maapektuhan nito yung balance nyo um can you please play the video Uh, back po, oh, sorry. Please pay, please pay the video. Hindi po ma-play. Um, maybe I could um share my slide in order I could play the video. Yes, Can you see my slides? Yes, yes we can see JV, but not a video. There you go. Um, this uh, this is a bird is actually pregnant, wearing a, a belly guard and doing this exercise for that is available for first trimester. These are simple lunges. Well, that we could um, practice in order for stretching as well as exercise. Ayan ang mga buntis natin yan.
So those are the kinds of exercises that you can use. And um, for one last is we have yoga exercises that are safe during pregnancy. So, um, can we go back to my slides? Um, sorry, I'm sorry, my spot. Yeah, thank you. So, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, so kaya kaya naman yon, di ba? Sa alam natin kaya ng mga pregnant women, uh, pregnant mommies natin yon. So now we we now talk about maternal nutrition. So number one, eating well is one of the best things that you can do during your pregnancy. And good nutrition can help you handle the extra demands of your body as your pregnancy progresses. And the goal of uh, pregnancy is to um, get a balance, uh, getting enough nutrients to support the, your, the growth of your fetus and maintaining a heat, healthy weight. Next slide, please. So, upper press book. So, how much should I eat during this pregnancy? You know, there's a popular saying that uh, kumakain ako para sa dalawa or I eat for two because it's for me and my growing child. But, um, as we know that it is quite dangerous to eat twice your usual amount of food during the pregnancy. Next slide. Uh, please press. So eating for two, instead of eating for two, think of it, think of it as eating twice as healthy. Next book. So like um, Dr. Garcia has said, um, you need an additional 100 to 300 kilocalories per day um, per trimester. So, Next, please. So that's a um, roughly a um, calorie count of a glass of skim and have a sandwich. So we may, um, um, why do we need this extra calorie? Just because um, the, your pregnancy is required and uh, it's because pregnancy is required, uh, requires additional 8,000 calorie K calories during the last 20 weeks. And to meet this demand, like uh, we've been discussing earlier, um, a caloric intake of 100 to 300 kilocalories per day is recommended during this pregnancy. Next, please. Another piece. So you might say, Doc, balance naman po yung diet ko. Bakit kailangan ko pa po uminom ng vitamins? Of course, you do need to take vitamins because not all mothers could get the enough nutrition from food intake alone. Therefore, it is important for you to take 
your prenatal vitamins because they also play an important role in all of your body functions. And eating healthy foods and taking prenatal medications every day should supply all the vitamins and minerals you need during your pregnancy, pregnancy especially in supporting the growth of your baby. Next slide, please. So what vitamins and minerals do I need during this pregnancy? First, we need folic acid, iron, calcium, vitamin D, choline, omega-3, and fatty acids, vitamin B complexes, and vitamin C. You, as, uh, if you would notice, um, these um, vitamins and minerals are already, you are already taking them because they are being already prescribed by your doctors. So next. So folic acid, also known as folate, it is important for a pregnant woman because it may help um, prevent major birth defects of the brain and spine called neural tube defects or mga cleft spine or um, as you see here, anencephaly meaning hindi na buo na maayos yung utak at nambuto sa bungo or encephalo, encephalocele meaning parang meron siyang lalagyan or sak sa likod ng ulo sa hi, ng um, pag hindi pagiging kompleto ng pagsara ng bungo. Um, this uh, folic acid is naturally found in food such as leafy green vegetables, uh, oranges, and beans. Next, please. So, how much folic acid should I take? At least um, 400 microgram um, of folic acid each day at least one month before pregnancy because um, getting this amount of folic acid from food alone is quite difficult. Um, you should take your daily prenatal vitamins, um, your daily prenatal vitamins. Then um, women who had um, children who had previous pregnancies with neural tube defects would take uh, 4 milligrams of folic acid. Uh, but as I said, um, you and your OBGYN or other obstetric care providers, um, who can, uh, you could discuss this further in order what supplementation that you need for your pregnancy. Next, please. <clears throat> so iron is used by your body to make extra blood for you and your fetus during pregnancy. And in women who are not pregnant, um, they would be in need of 800 milligrams, I, one, oh, sorry, 18 milligrams of um, um, iron per day. And how much more in pregnant women that they are uh, carrying, like I said, to, uh, uh, they're um, taking care of themselves and their growing fetuses. So they would uh, need more of 27 milligrams per day um, in which this increased amount is found in most prenatal vitamins. And even, pag sabi, ah, Dr. Uh, after po ba kung mga na, pwede na po ako hindi mag-iron? No. Even after delivery, after mo mga na, um, you'll be stating, you'll still be needing to take this iron supplements because um, there is certain blood losses that you have incurred during your delivery. Next, please. So, in addition in taking prenatal vitamins with iron, you should eat um, iron-rich foods such as, like I said, beans, um, breakfast cereals, um, beef, liver, shrimp, and foods that could help you absorb the iron such as orange juice, grapefruit, strawberries, broccoli, and peppers. Next. So, calcium is a mineral that builds your fetus's bones and teeth. And women who are at the age 18 or younger would have um would need a uh, intake of one thousand three hundred uh, milligram of calcium per day, and for um ages nineteen and older, they would be needing one thousand milligram per day. Next slide, please. So milk and other daily products such as cheese, yogurt, um, are the best source of calcium. But if you are if you are having trouble digesting milk products, you could get calcium from other sources such as broccoli or fortified foods like um, such as cereals, breads and juices, almonds, um, sesame seeds, um, sardines or anchovies, 
or in dark green leafy vegetables. You could also get calcium from cancel supplements, which would contain um, 1,000 uh, micrograms of calcium. Next, please. So vitamin D, AKA also the sun. So, so vitamin D works with calcium in helping, um, in, in helping the fetus develop their bones and teeth and also developing healthy skin and eyesight. And all women, which are pregnant or not, they need at least 600 international units of vitamin D per day. Next slide, please. So what if hindi po ako pwede sa arawan, hindi po ako ganito or masyado mainit kasi hindi po ako naaabutan po ng uh, late na po ako nagigising, masyado ng tirik ang araw, safe po ba? No. So there are foods that uh, have good sources of vitamin D such as uh, fortified milks, uh, fatty fishes such as um, salmons and mackerels, fish liver oils, and egg yolks. Next, please. So, omega-3 fatty acids are a type of fat found in many kinds of fish, and it is important for the brain development before and after birth. So, um, aside from fish, um, other foods such as flax seeds are good sources also of omega-3. Other food sources such as broccoli, kidney beans, spinach, and cauliflower and walnuts are also good sources. Next, next slide, please. However, um, as a disclaimer, and like Dr. Garcia has um, um, discussed, not all fish are advisable for pregnant women. Hence, what type of fish should you avoid? There are fishes that have higher levels of mercury than others, and mercury is a metal that is linked to many birth defects. So you can't eat those king mackerels, those sharks, swordfish, or um, uh, yeah, and also, so you should also check for advisories be, uh, about fish caught in local waters because sometimes there are at least for red tide. Um, there's a possibility na um mababanga siya sa mercury content, but doing um infection. So better that you stay away from those kinds of things. Next slide, please. Vitamin B. Uh, what are vitamin? B complexes. So the B vitamins would include their B1, B2, 6, 9, and B12, which are key nutrients during your pregnancy. Um, they um, they give you energy, they supply you, they supply energy for your fetus's development, good vision, and builds the placenta as well. And they are also helpful in nausea and vomiting during pregnancy. And as we all know, some um vomiting is a common symptom. During, preg uh, during pregnancy, during pregnancy, especially in the first trimester, due to hormonal changes. Next, please. So, your prenatal vitamin would have the right amount of vitamin uh, B that you need each day. But um, food sources such as liver, pork, chicken, um, bananas, beans, um, whole grain cereals, and breads are also good sources of um, vitamin D. Your folic acid in, uh, is also a part of vitamin D, which is your B9 as well. Next slide, please. So vitamin C, it is very important for a healthy immune system. It helps, um, it also helps you to build strong bones and muscles. And during pregnancy, you should have at least uh, 85 milligrams of vitamin C each day. And if you're all, um, and 80 milligrams of vitamin C if you're younger than 19. Um, as we know, the separate vitamin C is already in a um usually in a 500 milligram preparation. And but you don't have to worry because not all of these are being absorbed in your body. And one tablet is enough to get uh, is enough to get the recommended daily allowance. Next slide, please. So what foods can contain vitamin C? You could get um, it from citrus fruits, juices, strawberries, broccoli, and tomatoes as well. Next slide. Water. So, sabihin, sabihin, Dr. Ra, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm drinking enough water during this pregnancy. So how can I make sure I get enough water? So just drink throughout the day, even though, even if you're not just thirsty. So you should aim for about eight 
12 cups of water per day um, during your pregnancy because it could improve um, episodes of constipation, which is very common in pregnant women and even in postpartum patients. And it keeps you cool now, especially in this, in this uh, with this heat, and it decreases the risk of urinary tract infections. And it is very important for you to hydrate because it um it can also increase the fluid surrounding the baby in the womb. Next, please. So at the at your first initial oh sorry at your initial prenatal visits, um they would take note of your weight and height to be able to get your body mass index or BMI. And it is used to assess if you are underweight with the normal range, overweight or obese. And um, for each um, category, a, there is a corresponding total weight gain re recommended for pregnancy. Next, please. So um, excess weight during pregnancy um, is associated with several pregnancy and childbirth complications included high blood pressure, which could lead also to preeclampsia, preterm birth and gestational diabetes. And for your um for your babies, they could have fetal macrosomia or sila, birth injuries at risk for cesarean um cesarean sections and birth defects such as neural tube defects. Next, but we should also know that to um um, less weight gain or too less of a weight gain is also not good because this could cause an inadequate maternal weight gain that could also lead to preterm birth, fetal growth restrictions, or low birth weight. Um, it is important also to screen for these kinds of things as early as possible for proper intervention. And therefore, we also always request their mommies to have a well-balanced diet and high protein energy supplementation is always advised. Next, so in summary, um, a pregnant woman can exercise um, if there are no contraindications um, with proper precautions. And even after pregnancy, this could help lose the extra weight that they've gained. Usually after two weeks, um, most mothers are able to return to their normal um, full duties or activities. However, um, you should always consult with your OBGYN and when it is safe to start exercising again, especially for those who had cesarean deliveries or even um, vaginal deliveries who had episiotomies and repair. Then monitor, monitor maternal weight gain because like I said, too much and too less is not good. Then you should eat well by eating well-balanced meals with grains, fruits, and vegetables, high-protein food for energy, and always, and make sure you are able to hydrate well. And prenatal medications should also be taken to achieve recommended daily allowances for each vitamins and minerals that you would be needing, not just for you, but for your pregnancy as well. Next slide, please. So here ends my um, discussion for... Um, maternal nutrition and I just hope that you're able to um, learn something today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Carlos. Of course, we learned so much from your lecture. Yes. Um, now, uh, we take a little breather. We will give gifts to our participants through a raffle. Uh, may I call on Dr. Orbanas to conduct the raffle? Good morning, Pa. So for our first raffle promo, we're giving out 10 winners of uh, multivitamins from World Philippines. For our first winner, uh, Miss Zia uh, Abanto. Here. Next is Miss uh, Christine Awa. Third is Miss Larmy Grace Edsla. Congratulations. Our fourth winner is Miss Donna Enciso. And then our fifth winner is Miss Antonette Hamandre.
Miss Catriza Mame. Miss Jillian Gonzalez. Miss Kislev and Kisano, it's for our eighth winner. We have two more. Miss, uh, Mr. Gio Reyes. And our last winner for uh, our first part is Miss uh, Maria jo Jonaline Baure. Congratulations to our first VRP Medical Center, OBGYN depart Department at 4th floor, delivery room. Congratulations. Okay, thank you, Dr. Urbanos, and congratulations to all the winners, and thank you to the sponsors. Now we move on to our last lecture by Dr. Valenzuela about ultrasound in pregnancy. Uh, Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Ana Celina Valenzuela, and I'll be talking to you about ultrasound in pregnancy. I would like to begin by first defining what is ultrasound. An ultrasound, also called a sonogram, is a prenatal test that is offered to all pregnant women. It uses high-frequency sound waves and a computer screen to show a picture of your baby inside the womb. The sample picture on the right is called a profile view of the baby, and from this single picture alone, we, your doctors, can already deduce a lot of things about your baby. I'm sure this is a question at the forefront of your minds. Is it safe? The answer is a very definite yes. As long as it is done by your healthcare provider, ultrasound is very safe. Because ultrasound uses sound waves instead of radiation, it is much safer than x-rays. By now, we have been using ultrasound for more than 30 years already and all studies have confirmed its safety and efficacy. The next question is, what is it for? How often do I need to have an ultrasound done? In order to answer this question, it would be easier to divide into the first and the second and third trimester ultrasound. Let us begin with the first trimester, which is from the time of conception up to when the baby is 14 weeks old. Ultrasound done at this time is transvaginal. You will be asked to lie down on the bed with your legs on the stirrups. The probe will be inserted into the vaginal canal to view the baby. Don't worry, I understand that this may induce anxiety, but apart from mild discomfort, this procedure is not painful at all. What is it for? The first and primary reason this is done is to confirm the pregnancy. After testing positive on a urine home pregnancy kit, we want to check and confirm if you are really pregnant. This is done by visualizing what is called the gestational sac. The presence of this black structure inside the uterus confirms an intrauterine pregnancy. Next, a first trimester ultrasound is done to confirm fetal viability by checking the baby's heartbeat. On this screen, you can see samples of the sound waves produced by the baby's heartbeat. The ultrasound machine then computes automatically for the fetal heart rate. Another important reason the first trimester ultrasound is done is to determine the gestational age of your baby and to compete for the expected due date. For example, if you look at the sample ultrasound, the length of the fetus is measured to be 3.73 centimeters, which would give an age of gestation of 10 weeks and 5 days. From this data, we can also compete for the expected due date. Your OB will also request for a first trimester ultrasound to check for the number of babies. Is it single pregnancy, twins, or even triplets? These can all be confirmed in the first trimester ultrasound. On the sample ultrasound on the screen, you can see the gestational sacs labeled A, B, and C, meaning this is a triplet pregnancy. This is another important use of the first trimester ultrasound. It's to check for the location of the pregnancy. We know that in normal pregnancies, the baby is positioned inside the uterus right here. Sometimes, however, we get ectopic pregnancies wherein the embryo implants somewhere else. In the sample picture, the baby here implanted in the fallopian tube, so this is an ectopic pregnancy. This can all be seen and confirmed via the first trimester ultrasound. 
We will now move on to the second and third trimester ultrasound, also known as the pelvic ultrasound. For this type, you will be asked to lay on your back on an exam table, then lift your shirt to expose your abdomen. Your doctor will cover your belly with a thin layer of gel, and this water-based gel will help the sound waves move more easily so that you can get a clearer ultrasound picture. What is it for? The main reason an ultrasound is done during the second and third trimesters is to monitor your baby's growth. Certain measurements, such as what's seen on the screen, are done during this ultrasound to compete for your baby's weight. Depending on your baby's age of gestation, your OB will then tell you if your baby's weight is appropriate for gestational age, meaning baby is growing properly. This ultrasound can more importantly tell you if your baby is either too small or too big. Another thing your OB will check at the second and third trimester ultrasound is the amount of amniotic fluid volume. Too high or too low amniotic fluid volume may be a sign of problems or fetal distress. For example, look at the two images on the screen. The black area that you see is the amniotic fluid. As you can see, the amniotic fluid on the left image is normal. On the other hand, there is too little amniotic fluid on the image on the right, a condition called oligohydramnios. Another reason this ultrasound is done is to check baby's position. Is it head first or cephalic or butt first or breech or even transverse? This is very important because this can determine whether you can deliver vaginally or when baby's head is first or via cesarean section or when the baby is transverse. We already know that first trimester ultrasound can determine the number of fetuses. Pelvic ultrasound is done to confirm those findings. On the picture on the left, you see a second trimester pelvic ultrasound showing the heads of two babies. On the picture on the right, you see a 3D ultrasound during the third trimester showing a twin gestation. The pelvic ultrasound may also be requested by your OB for a fetal anatomic survey which is when the sonologist would visualize all the fetal parts, namely abdomen, stomach, arms, legs, other body parts, back of the neck, head and brain, heart chambers and valves, and the kidneys. Second and third trimester ultrasound is also done to check the placenta and its location. Normally, it should be high-lying. Sometimes, however, it can be either low-lying or even be called placenta previa, which is when the placenta covers the cervix, such as this one. When there is placenta previa, you cannot deliver vaginally due to risk of bleeding, so patients with placenta previa have to deliver via cesarean section. One non-medical reason for doing ultrasound at the second trimester, as requested by the parents, is to determine if the baby is a boy or a girl. After 14 weeks age of gestation, the baby's genitalia have already fully developed, so pelvic ultrasound can be done to determine that. On the picture on the left, you can see what's called the turtle sign, where you see the baby's penis pointed to by the arrow. And on the picture on the right, you can see what is called the burger sign, which is represented by the baby girl's labial folds. So far, we have discussed standard ultrasound tests. There are a number of more advanced ultrasounds that you and your OB can request for, such as biophysical profile, Doppler ultrasound, 3D or 4D ultrasound, and fetal echocardiography. We'll first discuss biophysical profile ultrasound. This is a prenatal test used to check on a baby's well-being. This test combines fetal heart rate monitoring or a non-stress test and a fetal ultrasound to evaluate a baby's heartbeat breathing, movements, muscle tone, and amniotic fluid level. Typically, a biophysical profile is recommended for women at increased risk of problems that could lead to pregnancy complications, such as if you have a medical condition such as diabetes, high blood pressure, or heart disease, if you have a multiple pregnancy, or if your pregnancy has extended past your due date. The next special type of ultrasound is called Doppler ultrasound. This is used to check for blood flow and is usually recommended if your baby isn't growing normally or if estimated fetal weight is below the 10th percentile for gestational age. If there is suspicion of anemia in the baby or if the mother has hypertension, 
This type of test would be requested by your OB to make sure that there is adequate blood flow and nutrients going to your baby. 3D ultrasound is something I'm sure all of you are familiar with. This is the test mothers request to see a glimpse of their baby's face. Although a lot of times this type of ultrasound is not medically indicated, sometimes your OB will request for this to see more clearly a possible structural anomaly, such as the picture here, wherein a usual ultrasound, you can see the presence of a cleft lip, and this is confirmed by a 3D ultrasound. 4D ultrasound is like a 3D ultrasound, but it also shows your baby's movements in a video. A fetal echo is performed if your OB suspects that your baby may have congenital heart defects. This test may be done similarly to a pelvic ultrasound, but it might take longer to complete. It captures an in-depth image of your baby's heart, one that shows the heart size, shape, and structure. This ultrasound also gives your OB a look at how your baby's heart is functioning, which is helpful in diagnosing fetal heart problems. That's it. That's the end of my lecture, and I hope you all learned a lot. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Valenzuela. Um, that ends the lecture part of our um, activity this morning. Now the floor is open for your questions. So we actually have many questions in our chat box and I have tried to um, gather according to topic. If we, let us start, um, let us start with Dr. Garcia. Uh, I have a question at PM that was sent to me. Uh, when do you go for prenatal checkup? Is it right away when your pregnancy test is positive? Hi, Dr. yes, good morning to Ulet. Yes, po. Yes, um, once your pregnancy test turns positive, we recommend you to right away do a prenatal consult with your obstetrician and gynecologist. First of all, there's a need to um, age your pregnancy. So accurate uh, aging May, will be done by your obstetrician as well as uh, giving you with giving you laboratory tests and ultrasound reports. So it's right away, okay. Yes, and then, um, pwede ba ang teleconsult ang prenatal? Paano check ang baby? Well, of okay, course, with so, pandemic, it was all teleconsult. Yes. yes. So with the advent of uh, teleconsultation. Uh, this is done, this can be done if you are having a low-risk pregnancy. So um, to limit also your exposure to uh, outside, outside forces that can cause COVID-19 infection. So this can be done, but if you're having a um, high-risk pregnancy, uh, we recommend that you would go to your obstetrician for a face-to-face -face consult so that they can assess you properly. Um, with the low risk pregnancies, what I, I mentioned that uh, teleconsult is okay to do, but it would be advisable also to visit your obstetrician for a face to face consult every once in a while. Like say um, two every one every one for your first trimester, and then for the second and the third trimester, we would advise that you would have a more frequent face to face consult rather than a teleconsult. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question. Up to what month is travel allowed? And related to it, there is a question in the chat box. Ang nobya ko po ay 28 weeks na buntis. Tanong kung safe ba ang sexual contact at anong week po ba bawal na? Salamat po. So travel and sexual contact. Okay. With regards to air travel or travel in particular, uh, we advise air travel at uh, at least at uh, 36 weeks. So like what I mentioned, uh, your airline provider or your airline will probably request for a medical certificate so that uh, you will be allowed uh, boarding to their aircraft and your, your obstetrician will usually be, give, be giving you that unless, of course, you have a high-risk pregnancy where it you will not be allowed to board an airplane or to travel by land. For the question about the sexual contact, 
sexual contact is allowed in any trimester of the pregnancy. But of course, we caution you to um, maybe limit or uh, have uh, abstinence during the first trimester as um, sexual contact may cause threatened preterm leave, uh, threatened miscarriage. For the second and third trimester, this is safer, but um, you are cautioned because uh, the semen of the male will, will contain um, substance that may cause preterm labor. So at any time of the pregnancy, it is allowed. But if you're having high-risk pregnancy, such as if you're diagnosed with presentable media, or if you if you are having preterm labor, then uh, we would advise to abstain. So sexual contact all throughout pregnancy for low-risk patients? For low-risk, yes. yes. Uh, well, to add on, um, in my experience, most airlines would accept only up to 32 weeks of the pregnancy. So if a pregnant woman plans to travel back home to deliver back home or so, make sure you do it before your 32 weeks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Garcia. Uh, Dr. Carlos, there's a question in the chat box. A question po, how do you know po na it's time to diet na po during pregnancy kasi sabi po nila dapat bagay, ibigay, sorry, yung cravings ng buntis po. Actually, there are, um, like I said, um, when it's your initial prenatal checkup, um, your, B, uh, your height and weight are being taken in order to compute your body mass index. Uh, then, uh, there is an average total weight gain that you could get per if, if in what category that you may fall under. So, if you're underweight, um, you would have a total weight gain of 28 pounds to 40 pounds. If you're in the normal BMI, it's 25 to 35. And if you're overweight, shepherd must less of around um, 15 to 25. And then if you're on the heavier side or the obese category, um, it's much more less. It's around 11 to 20 pounds. Uh, the total weight gain that you um, Thus, if your obstetricians would uh, get to see that you are gaining too much weight or not gaining the weight that is appropriate for your body mass index, um, they would um, uh, recommend you medications. Or if you're under, if you're not in the, if you're not a car at the total weight gain that you need during this pregnancy, they would give you medication. They would advise certain diets, um, and certain food intakes in order for you to reach that um, required amount of weight gain. But if you're above that said weight gain range, um, there are also, like I said, modifications, exercises, um, food, um, um, uh, portioning of food intake that is allowable and acceptable in your category. And if, if it would not um, affect you and so cravings ng buntis, madami yon, diba? <laughs> yeah, so you have to be the, yes. the cravings, yes, we do understand that cravings are a big part of this. So we advise that if these cravings are in high caloric intake, meds of trim down konti, example, like Dr. Yeah. Uh, Cariano uh, Garcia said earlier that Jan, hindi mo wala ang coffee sa kanila. So what they do is, ma'am, for this pregnancy, you have to limit yourself in the yeah. coffee or yeah. even watch much, uh, not really much worse, but in order to prevent mm -hmm. other different complications, they ask you to go to the caffeinated version of the coffee. Um, in order to, um, uh, it's not just for your welfare, but for the welfare of your baby. Yeah. So we do understand that there are three things during pregnancies, but we try to like um slim them down, especially on the heavier side. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, we understand that we have to crave gusto bulk load agad yung crave or kaya bandehado nandiyan madami magsakad. We advise them to like um take a small portion of it it might satisfy the craving. Don't forget to also take your 
daily dose of um, fiber, increase fluids, para hindi siya, hindi, you're not outside your recommended total weight gain range. Thank you, Dr. Carlos. So I have two related questions. I have lactose intolerance. Can I skip the milk for pregnant women? And a related question is, uh, my mommy po kasi na nagkas pag sabi sa akin na kapag may picos ka and buntis, di daw allowed uminom ng maternal milk because of the sugar. Organic milk will do daw po. But I feel like the enough yung organic milk. Pero nag-OGTT test and it's normal. Uh, okay naman po ang sugar. And I recommend din sa akin mag-maternal milk ng OP. So this is about the milk supplement that we give our patients. So there's lactose intolerance. Um, yes, what do you advise for the lactose for the lactose intolerance, there are milk formulas um, made for um, for our maternal our uh, maternal intake that um sabi na yung earlier na parang organic or kaya um mas more meaning for people who are lactose intolerant. Sometimes means uh, sometimes there are soy milk, there are also um yes. almond milk that is much less um, that are more hypoallergenic and beneficial for the mommy. Um, with regards to the uh, maternal milk, um, there are maternal milks that have um, computed sugars already. Um, they have already different formulations, uh, formulations for this, um, which uh, they could uh, they would recommend to you because they would say, Oh, mommy, oh, mommy, ito, pwede yung maternal milk, ito, for you, it has less sugar, um, this is more beneficial for you because, for example, you have patients who are diabetic, that even increase their sugars. Um, that's why there are certain maternal milks that have low sugar intake or low sugar intake, but they could get the benefit of calcium that they need for this treatment. Okay. Thank you. There is a question here. I often experience vomiting. Will my baby be affected with poor nutrition? Um, with this vomiting episodes, they have to determine on how many times this uh, vomiting episode happened or if um, we have to also assess the well of the baby as well. So more importantly, we assess the mommy because they are the ones who get, uh, they, they are the ones who have loss of appetite, they are the ones who are being dehydrated. In the long run, um, uh, must affected the mommy versus the baby as well. So that's why um, we give supplementations, nutrients, like I said earlier, B complexes could also help with um, the vomiting episodes. And of course, frequent monitoring and surveillance for both mother and the, the, uh, the fetus as well. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, there's another question. There are certain foods that are not allowed during pregnancy. Is this true? Well, we often hear this, the Lola says no eating talong or watermelon and etc. There are many myths about food during pregnancy. Actually, Dr. So, there are more like parang, you cannot intake crab because you have deformities, bawal ganito, bawal yes. but as we said earlier, there are certain moderations of food that you can take and we have to outweigh the benefits versus the risk of having those foods with watermelon sometimes the concern of for that is the sugar intake uh i mean the sugar content in those watermelons but aside from that um there is also fluid intake it's more of the glue um we're more worried about so like i said proper uh proper diet and um your um portioning of food intake could also help resolve this. Sometimes we could even consult um, our OBGYNs in order to refer us to nutritionists who could help um, our mothers to be with concerns regarding, oh, I want this food, I don't eat this kind of food. Um, what could I use 
uh, as an alternative for this or how could I still have this kinds of food without eating it too much or affecting me and my baby as well? Yes, thank you, Dr. Carlos. Of course, food is food. For the non-risk pregnant patients, you can eat as you wish. Yes, of course. Uh, but if you listen to your Lola, there's nothing wrong. <laughs> okay, um, we move on, Dr. Valenzuela. There are questions. Uh, of course, the, the link for the exercise has been shared in the chat box. If you wish to download, it's on YouTube channel. Okay, now uh, there's a question um, the, about determining gender during ultrasound. How accurate is it? Because uh, at first, the, my baby was female, then succeeding ultrasound, it was male. So uh, usually, th this really happens, you know, yeah. with our Valenzuela, <laughs> yeah. Usually what we say is, if we say that your baby okay. is male, it's more often than not correct. More, maybe more than 95% accurate because if we see the turtle sign, that is really already the penis. When we, that, when we say that the baby is a female, there's really a chance that it could be wrong, especially if the baby's position isn't, that, um, um, isn't best during that time because there's really a chance that the penis is just hiding. So the sonologist would be able to would, uh, interpret that as having no um, penis when in fact it's just there hiding. So if yeah. the sonologist says that the baby is male, more, most likely it's correct. However, take note that if the um, ultrasound for gender determination is done too early, sometimes there's such a thing as clitoral um, hypertrophy. So you might think it's a penis when in fact it's just a clitoris. So it's really nothing can be 100% accurate. Yeah. Uh -oh. Except if it's male. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, we often get the report that it says appears female. Appear, yes. Yes. So not definitely female. Thank you, Dr. Valenzuela. There's a question here. Um, is it possible that ultrasound is not transvaginal? For uh, the first time. Especially when there's bleeding. Yes. Actually, yeah. for the first trimester, the. Um, uh, using a transvaginal probe, just it's we use it because it's more accurate. It allows the probe to be nearer the uterus, which at that time is actually very low in your pelvis. So if you do a transabdominal ultrasound, the accuracy isn't that great. Yes, it can still be done, but you have to understand that the accuracy might not be the best. So if, for instance, patients who are too anxious, they refuse to have a transvaginal ultrasound done, Yes, we can, we can still do transabdominal, but remember that the accuracy would be lower. We still would highly recommend transvaginal for the first trimester. Most, most uh, accurate is still transvaginal. So uh, I had a congenital anomaly scan. Is this accurate? What if there is a defect? What do the OB usually do? So if a uh, so, congenital yeah. anomaly scan is a more detailed pelvic ultrasound. So using, uh, with a congenital anomaly scan, we, we check all the structures that we can. However, at the beginning of the scan, you will notice the sonologist would usually tell you that it's not, it can't detect 100% of lesions. For instance, uh, heart defects, ventricular septal defects that are too small. So these cannot be really... Uh, Take note that all these structures are very, very tiny. So we're dealing with very, very small structures inside the fetal body. So yes, there's a chance that not all structures can be detected. What if we do detect something? For instance, um, let's say the, again, ventricular septal defect. That's when we request for another test, such as a fetal echocardiography, so that we can do a more targeted examination next time. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think I have covered most of the questions that are in the chat box and in the personal messages to me. Um, so, um, any more? No more. Okay. You want an, uh, any ending? Ah, sorry, did I miss something? I'm yes. Asking in the chat box regarding the normal heart rate of the baby, I think. I, okay, what is the normal heart rate of healthy baby? Uh, this is a fetus in, in 
inside me. Maybe different when baby is born. Or Dokora Garcia. Um, like what I mentioned earlier in my lecture, the normal heart rate of a baby is 110 to 160 beats per minute. So anything below this or above this would warrant um, investigation so as to um, give cure if there is if uh, one is needed. Okay. So there's one PM to me. Ang hirap mag-exercise. Masakit na yung katawan ko sa pagbuntis ko. <laughs> True? And I am not an exercise person before pregnancy. So, well, there's nothing wrong if you don't do the exercises recommended. <laughs> but then we encourage all pregnant patients to have an active lifestyle so you don't be a sedentary person. So it's really difficult once uh, you're pregnant, when you experience this pregnancy and all these the changes in your body. But then rest assured, the medical staff, especially of uh, the OBGYN department of the BRP Medical Center, we are always here to help with uh, whatever um, symptoms and questions you have. So uh, thank you for joining us in this uh, Alagang Ina webinar. Uh, we hope we have contributed to your doubts and myths about your pregnancy, your prenatal checkup, your ultrasound questions, and your uh, nutrition and your exercises. Um, so we have another raffle. We have more prices for our attendees, so please stay on. Uh, Dr. Arbanas. Starbucks na. <laughs> so for, for the next part of the raffle, we're going to give away 10 winners of the mother and baby essential bags, which contains products from absolute drinking distilled water and uh, M2 Malungay tea drinks. And then also five winners of assorted multivitamins from Multicare with Starbucks, Starbucks gift certificate. So for our first winner, for the 10 winners of Mother and Baby Essential Bags. Ms. Grethel Joanna. Next is Ms. Acosta Nori. Third winner is Tala Burger Jaira. Fourth is Ms. Franco Claire. Fifth is Miss Alcantara Betsy. Ma'am Betsy, thank you for attending po, ma'am. Sixth is Miss Ray Ann Dakanay. Seventh is Miss Charmaine Enot. Eighth winner is Miss Aquino Joanel. Ninth is Miss Orpelia Daisy Jane. And last winner for the uh, from Mom and Baby Essential Bag yeah. is Miss Jacqueline Giuliano. So now we're going to draw five winners of uh, assorted multivitamins from Multicare and the Starbucks gift certificate. So we draw five more. Our first winner is Miss. Marita Tobeo. Second winner, Ms. Mac, Mr. Maxwell Lumbres. Our third winner, Ms., uh, my sister, Avery Zest Obanos. <laughs> the fourth winner, Ms. Melody Ann Pablico. And our last winner for this morning's uh, raffle draw is Miss Darlene Torla. Oh, congratulations so to all the winners. <laughs> so you can claim all of your prizes here at uh, VRPMC uh, OBGYN department at the fourth floor delivery room. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Arbanas. So I'd like to thank our dear sponsors for this project, the Alagang Ina. Well, of course, we have the VRP Medical Center Admin Office, and then we have the Multicare Philippines, the makers of uh, Mosbit Elite, Sorbi for Durials, 
Nutriobi, Calvit Gold, and Onaima. And then we have Word Philippines, makers of multivitamins and sidereal. And then we have Absolute Distilled Water and Nature Earth, makers of M2 Malungay tea. Uh, now, um, to end our session this morning, uh, of course, uh, we invite you to the succeeding Alagang Ina uh, webinars. We still have more coming this uh, year. This is just the first for this year to guide you throughout your pregnancy, delivery, and aftercare, after your delivery. Um, uh, if for any questions, you can just go to our uh, delivery room complex. We have all our staff there ready to help you. And uh, BRP Medical Center offers packages for deliveries, which are very affordable. And of course, like the motto says, Alaga at safe ka dito sa BRP. Now, um, we call on to give us our uh, closing remarks, Dr. Zeni Malabanan, who is the Vice Chairman of the Department of BRP, of OB of the BRP Medical Center, Dr. Zeni. Before we end this activity, let me thank the people behind its success, our esteemed lecturers, who have shared with us their expertise this afternoon, Drs. Ina Valenzuela, Hen Caliano Garcia, and Jaili Carlos. Our residents, especially Dr. Arian Obanos, for planning and executing a flawless program. Dr. Becky Akawili, head of the Alagang Ina Committee, for her guidance. Our department chair, Dr. Ney Abad, for her leadership our VRP admin family for their unwavering support, our sponsors for the prizes, Multicare Philippines with products of Mosvit Elite, Sorbifer Durules, Calvit Gold, and Onima, Word Philippines whose products are Nutri-10 OB, Sideral, and Day Zinc, Absolute Distilled Drinking Water, and the Nature for M. Tumalunggay, Tea drinks. At kayo, mahal naming mga pasyente, maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong pagdalo at pakikinig sa aming alagang ina mother's class. Continue to be empowered women by reading and engaging in similar learning activities. Sabi nga nila, knowledge is power. Umaasa kami na mga ang napakinggan ninyo ngayong umaga ay makakatulong sa inyong pag-aalaga sa inyong mga sarili, sa inyong pagkubuntis, at sa inyong mga magiging sanggol. Mabuhay po kayong lahat. We look forward to seeing you again in our succeeding Alagang Ina Mother's Class Series. Magandang hapon po. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Malabanan, and thank you to all the participants. Uh, we hope to see you in the next um, Alagang Ina webinar for more uh, info and uh, bonding. And we hope it's going to be face to face already, but then uh, this is a good venue also. So thank you again. Yes, Doc, your, our next Alagang Ina will be on June. It's June. Okay. If pala you have topics that you want to us to discuss with you in this kind of forum, we are open to suggestions. Thank you again. Thank you.